Welcome to Poets House live streaming. My name is Paolo Vier, broadcasting tonight from Lenape Hakim, the unceded territory of the Rockaway, Canarsie, and Matinecock peoples, in a place otherwise known as Queens, New York. I'm a poet and program director of Poets House, an organization that joins with all people of conscience to express outrage and pain as crisis grips our nation. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery murdered are just among the most recent victims of systemic racism in our nation. Simultaneously this week, we acknowledge the dreadful threshold of 100,000 deaths from COVID-19, which, because of systemic inequity, inordinately impacts communities of color. Poets House acts on the belief that poetry bears witness, incites the language of mutuality and care, and by so doing, insists on individual and collective action to bring about change. I wanted to wish everyone a happy pride as well, mindful of our courageous siblings in the struggle for equality in the month of June, marking the Stonewall riots at the end of June. I am certain that the spirits of Bayard Rustin, Marsha P. Johnson, and Sylvia Rivera are guiding the safety and well being of all of our brothers and sisters taking part in demonstrations across our city and nations and the world all over tonight. Our broadcast tonight is one of the ways that we are celebrating pride. We aim to support the poetic voice that is deep within us all. Noting this, I'm so pleased and honored to be welcoming our dear friend uh, and uh, great poet, essayist, biographer, activist, Mark Doty. Mark Doty is the author of more than 10 volumes of poetry and three memoirs. His many honors include the National Book Award, National Book Critics Circle Award, the Penn Martha Albrand Award for First Nonfiction, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, a Whiting Writers Award, a Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Award, and in the UK, the T.S. Eliot Prize. Mark is a professor at Rutgers University and lives in New York City. I am so looking forward to talking about Mark's latest book, What is the Grass? Walt Whitman in My Life. Mark, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Paolo. I'm really happy to be here and happy to talk about this book, which has been a long time in coming. Walt Whitman has been a guiding spirit, a puzzle, a mystery, a fountain of inspiration for me for a long time now. And I wanted to find a way to, as he might put it, reach toward him. He says in Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, did you look back at me because I shall have so long looked forward to you? And I wonder if that might be true, that I am in some way call to reciprocate Walt Whitman's call towards me as a reader, toward all of us as readers. What is the Grass is a book that is both a study of Whitman's life and a personal account of overlapping obsession, of being haunted by his poems and by his presence, by trying to understand how this man emerged seemingly out of nowhere with a book that we are still learning how to read, which has changed poetry in the United States and in fact around the world. This book, self-published in Brooklyn in 1855, 700 copies, most of them given away. We don't know that he actually sold any of them, although you could go down to the local phrenologist shop, which was the 1850s equivalent of a head shop, and purchase a copy in that sort of new age bookstore. But I'm not sure anyone did. Nonetheless, six editions later during Whitman's lifetime, maybe seven, depending on how you count them, and the book slowly begins to make its way until at this moment, somebody is reading Ways of Grass, in every language into which poetry is translated. The book has a perennial, extraordinary life, which I think arises from Whitman's urge to reach the reader directly, to refresh our sense of ourselves, and question means to yourself, are we, what are we in relationship to each other? What is it between us then, he asks. So I'm gonna read you a few passages from the book and talk a bit about some of the things that make Whitman's accomplishments so extraordinary. And here we are at the very beginning. It's 1855, and we're in Brooklyn, and Whitman is on his way to the publishers. When Walt Whitman walked through Brooklyn Heights, a sharp-aired morning, say, in the newly minted spring of 1855, headed toward the printing office of his friend Andrew Rome, did he know what he was carrying? I like imagining him, a large, roughly handsome man who appears older than his 35 years, the sense of purpose in his stride more pronounced as he approaches the shop at the corner of Fulton and Cranberry 
an intersection that no longer exists, since the two streets were reconfigured in the 20th century with the creation of Cadman Plaza. I picture a portfolio under his arm, pasteboard size covered in cloth like the green binding he'd choose for his first edition, a ribbon closure tied to keep the pages in place. Around him, the traffic of shoppers and deliverymen, errand boys, a few finer carriages, horse-drawn carts clattering and pleasingly fragrant, Vendors' voices darting between the open spaces in each other's repetitive declarations of what's on sale. Brooklyn, brisk with possibility. The sky runs to powdery blue. Adventurous little wind from the harbor, a chill still lingering on the shaded sides of streets. Ordinary business, the world as it constructs itself day after day, streaming by. Do his steps quicken or slow as he draws nearer the printer's door? Some acquaintance greets him as he passes, but the poet barely notices his attention is fixed on the brink on which he's poised, the condition of about to become himself. In a moment, a wave of potential, the expansive, dreaming overflow of his text will crash against the marble threshold and begin to become a singular fact, his longed for, dreamed book. And that book, when it was produced, was a very odd thing indeed. This is a facsimile edition, and it was just about this size, big, like a coffee table book, and it bears no author's name, on the spine, on the cover, or even on the title pages. What you get instead is an engraving. And it's a picture uh, drawn from a photograph, and it shows Whitman with his hand on his hip, famously wearing a slouchy hat, an open collared shirt so you can see his long johns underneath, a pose that ultimately looks relaxed and a little defiant. Like, you know, here I am. What do you think? Well, this is exactly the opposite of what any 19th century reader might have expected in an author's portrait. We expect a bust of some you know, Greek poet, uh, some Roman orator, uh, a shelf of books, a, a waistcoat and cravat, some the poet well-dressed and authoritative. This Whitman's authority clearly is gonna come from someplace else. Many years later, his secretary, Horace Traubel, asked him why he didn't put his name on the book. And the poet answered, well, it would have been like putting a name on the universe. I think he meant it. It means in part that he did not feel he was the sole author, that the book had come through him, it means that the book, like his sense of self, was a collaboration between forces, between perhaps in a way between all of us, the collective energies of life going forward are speaking through him in some way. The book appeared, uh, well, also on its engraving, there's an interesting little story about it. The bulge in the poet's trousers is of different sizes in different editions. You know, the book was reprinted any number of times to make up the full 700. Whitman either thought the bulge was too small or thought it was too big. Scholars aren't sure. But it's interesting that he would be revising that image from the very beginning. He was always a self-marketer and a self-promoter, something which seems to make him a quintessential New Yorker. He had no qualms selling his vision to the world. And what a vision it was. This leads me to want to talk a little bit about his relationship to the reader. I can't think of any other poet who so directly tries to read him, grab the reader by the collar, and pull us into his work. He wants us to be close to him. He wants us to trust him. He wants to get nearer to us than we have ever expected a poet to be. As if he could somehow climb through the page, through the ink. I want to read you a passage that speaks to that. Here he is telling us about who he is. Do you guess I have some intricate purpose? Well, I have, for the April rain has, and the mica on the side of a rock has. Do you take it I would astonish? Does this daylight astonish? Or the early red start twittering through the woods? Do I astonish more than they? This hour, I tell things in confidence. I might not tell everybody, but I will tell you. Who goes there, hankering, gross, mystical, nude? How is it I attract, extract strength from the beef I eat? What is a man anyway? What am I and what are you? All I mark as my own, you shall offset it with your own, else it were time lost listening to me. I do not snivel, that snivel the world over, that months are vacuums in the ground but wallow in filth, that life is a suck in a cell, and nothing remains at the end but threadbare crepe and tears. Whimpering and truckling, full with powder for infants. Conformity goes to the fourth removed. I cock my hat as I please, indoors or out. Shall I pray? Shall I venerate and be ceremonious? I have pried through the strata and analyzed to a hair and counseled with doctors and calculated close and found no sweeter fat than sticks to my own bones. In all people I see myself, 
none more, and not one a barley corn less. And the good or bad I say of myself, I say of them. And I know I am solid and sound. To me, the converging objects of the universe perpetually flow. All are written to me. And I must get what the writing means. And I know I am deathless. I know this orbit of mine cannot be swept by a carpenter's compass. I know I shall not pass like a child's curlicue cut with a burnt stick at night. Now that's not the voice of the individual self, which we know will always disappear. It's something larger. It's the voice of our collectivity. And Whitman believes that at its core, the self isn't a singular thing enclosed in our sack of skin, cut off from others. The self is a kind of doorway, as it were, into a larger self, into the whole life of human beings. Whitman wants to call that forth in us. He wants us to recognize value in one another. He wants us to keep a loving company with our fellow citizens and believes sincerely that this could be the basis of a new kind of democratic compact. This could be the ground upon which a decent society could be built, a message that we still very much need to hear at this moment. So it's unusual for a poet to want to convince an audience of something so firmly. Whitman said later he wished that he had been an orator instead of a poet because he thought he would have had a bigger audience. I can't think of any other poet, especially one who had written masterpieces like Song of Myself or like Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, who would want to be something else because it would have been more effective. I think he was wrong about that because the gift of poems is the way they last. Whitman, through his remarkable style, casual, offhand, making use of American speech, turning away from old European forms to make something fresh and distinctly American, has been able to make a vessel for his subjectivity that goes on speaking to us. It seems as alive now as it did in 1855. That is part of the secret of the poem's power, that they seem to push a lot of stuff out of the way. The old inherited forms, a kind of a stiff attitude of pomposity or a sense that a poet needs to be important, and talk to us directly, not underestimating us, not selling himself short, not preaching exactly, but exhorting, cheering us on, speaking from the truth as he knows it. The author of these pages had a third grade education. If the endless recitation of drills that comprised Brooklyn public schooling in the 1830s can be called that. At 11, the age around which many boys of his era began to work and learn a trade, he apprenticed to a printer. In the years before the publication of his book, he worked as a printer and journalist, an itinerant school teacher in small Long Island towns, a bookseller, a carpenter, a builder of houses. Had he died before the curious, oversized first edition of Leaves of Grass was published, it's unlikely we'd ever have heard his name. You'd think something in the early work of Walt Whitman would suggest the intelligence and scope, the sly wit and visionary luminosity of the pages stacked and wrapped in his ribbon portfolio. When he made his agreement with Andrew Rome, he was 35, and his publications consisted of a handful of forgettable poems and a larger quantity of windy prose, editorial pieces, melodramatic short stories, an urban mystery, serializing newspapers, and a crocheted temperance novel. There's nothing at all to make us suspect that this man will write a decent poem, much less reinvent American poetry. He would pay to publish his book, write many of the reviews of it himself, sell precious few, if in fact any copies, and then go right on to publish a second edition. Who'd have thought it would be a book that we have never finished reading? One he never finished writing, but simply revised and expanded until it was stretched some 30 years later into a lumpen thing almost beyond recognition. A book of presumption and daring, expansiveness and wild ambition. One with a few antecedents, yes, but nevertheless startlingly original, unlike anything that had ever been written before. What daring, heat, and light Whitman's masterworks admit. They proceed with absolute confidence to make the wildest claims, inventing a cosmogony, a theology, a stance toward reality. They burn with evangelical urgency, yet insist that no one requires a spiritual teacher. They find the basis for a social compact and the common bedrock of the desiring human body, and sing the inclusive, generous, common self in a mode so formally inventive that its first readers must have wondered if this was poetry at all. The combination, of unbridled, con the combination of unbridled content and unfamiliar form seems to have left even readers of considerable acumen in the dust. Emily Dickinson is said to have taken a peek inside and then firmly closed the book. Henry James noted with devastating simplicity, this will not do. I would like to thank that writers of such genius, whatever they may have said, recognized as kin the astonishing outpouring of work. 
It appeared from the hand of a self-proclaimed rough from Brooklyn, but there is no evidence that they did. There is surely an uncomfortable sort of admiration and kinship expressed in a letter from the great tormented Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, though. I always knew in my heart Walt Whitman's mind to be more like my own than any other man's living. As he is a very great scoundrel, this is not a pleasant confession. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Whitman's remarkable language, uh, the way in which he was able, in his best poems, to offer uh, prescriptions, uh, ways of living, statements, pronouncements about living and about the world, but to do so in such fresh ways that the poems seem absolutely alive today. He didn't always make the best choices in his revisions of poems over time. Uh, he was a great reviser in terms of some formal changes. Like for instance, Saw Myself, his masterwork poem, first poem in his first book, and how many poets can you say that, that one of the poems we continue to read that is referred to everywhere that's become part of our cultural fabric is the first poem in the first book, Saw Myself. Whitman at first published that 65 page long poem without any section breaks. It was simply one continuous flow, which leaves the reader at sea, honestly. You, you can't, it's hard to get a handle on it. It took him a dozen years to know to put section breaks in it, which changed everything. Because when you had a section, you, of course, emphasize the end of each one and the beginning of the next one. That pause makes things much more dramatic. The self may be continuous, the life may be continuous, but art needs breaks so that we can absorb it. So we're going to do that, but sometimes his revisions of word choices and lines uh, uh, feel awkward. One of the things he did as a younger poet was to introduce all kinds of American speech, the speech of tradesmen, street talk, um, Native American place names, slang that was coming in from miners, trappers, all uh, words of industry, words of new technologies into his poems. He, there was a big exhibition uh, in Manhattan, uh, early 1850s, uh, this was a, where um, the New York Public Library is now in Bryant Park. There was a great Crystal Palace, later to burn. That Crystal Palace held an exhibition of all industries and trades. And Whitman walks through that show, time after time, carrying his little green notebook and writing down words. Words for fossils, words for industrial processes, words for kinds of uh, plants. These things appear in Saw Myself and elsewhere. It's one of the things that makes me sound so American. That's one of the sources of this freshness. Another is the use of repeated phrases at the beginning of sentences. Because he doesn't use rhyme and meter, he needs something else to create expectation and tension to give regularity and also variation. So um, I'll show you just a little bit of his use of anaphora. Very beautiful section of the poem, and one which is um, really the first and one of the very few narratives in Song of Myself, even though we're not quite sure the identity of the other. Within it. We'll talk about that in just a minute. I mind how we lay in June, such a transparent summer morning. You settled your head athwart my hips and gently turned over upon me and parted the shirt from my bosom bone and plunged your tongue to my bare stripped heart and reached till you felt my beard and reached till you held my feet. Swiftly arose and spread around me the peace and joy and knowledge that pass all the art and argument of earth. And I know that the hand of God is the elder hand of my own. And I know that the spirit of God is the eldest brother of my own, and that all the men ever born are also my brothers, and the women my sisters and lovers, and that a kelson of the creation is love, and limitless a leaves stiff or drooping in the fields, and brown ants in the little wells beneath them, and mossy scabs of the worm fence, and heaped stones, and elder, and mullen, and pokeweed. Now, anaphora there, that phrase, I know, I know that the men and women, I know the hand of God is the elder hand of my own, I know the spirit of God is all the is the eldest brother of my own. And all the phrases that come after that, there's an implicit I know that precedes them. So these are statements of what the speaker has learned through this moment of erotic joy, which seems to have spilled over so that now the tenderness and pleasure the speaker feels is also residing in the stones and the mosses, every little thing around him. If this ended on a great note of rapture, I don't know I believe it as much. It's because this tenderness extends to all things. The poem becomes so beautiful. I know that the hand of God is the elder hand of my own. Elder hand is a word that Whitman has made up himself. And how beautiful that notion that our hands are younger versions of a divine hand, of an original hand. That's a word that he later cut from the poem and replaced with something banal. But there it is, and it's original freshness. 
also that word kelson. A kelson is the long wooden beam which um, supports or holds together a wooden ship. So it's usually curved and has ribs branching out from it. So if the kelson of the creation is love, that means that the creation is constructed, that it's unified, it's going somewhere as a boat does, and uh, that's a very comforting thought to think that love is holding this world together and leading it forward. So, anaphora comes uh, from Greek, obviously, and it comes to us particularly, it comes to Whitman, particularly from the King James Bible, which in some ways is much of it, much of the New Testament is a kind of gospel behind leaves of grass, an affirmative, humanistic, generous gospel. Whitman basically leaves the God part out. He does say the elder hand of God. He mentions God now and then. But what's really important to him is the experience of each spirit. And he does not believe that we need to worry about God too much or we need to uh, particularly follow spiritual leaders or teachers, even though he positions himself as a spiritual teacher. He thinks what's important is the listening to one's own soul and good transcendentalist that he is listening to nature, that in the world around us we will find everything we need to know to discover how to live. And it will help to have a copy of Leaf of Grass as well. As well as um, Anaphora, I want to talk about his use of the word you. And you notice that at the beginning of this passage, this, uh, there's this lovely moment of lying on the grass on a transparent summer morning, beautiful phrase. And you swiftly, you settled your hand athwart my hips, you parted the shirt from my bosom bone, reached you, felt my beard, and so on. So there's a you there. Who is that exactly? A lover? The poem has not mentioned that you previously, and you started out being a general one. The poem opens on, I celebrate myself, and whatever belongs to me, whatever atoms belong to me, as good belong to you. You meaning the reader, anyone. So what kinds of yous are very slippery? And in fact, uh, there was a you know computer scan of his complete text done, and what was the word most frequently used? You. The poem needs you to complete it. There is no song of myself, no possibility of a song of myself without you to listen to it. Whitman wants to bring us into that project. He wants us to keep him company and to join with him. That you is so slippery, and that's a, a delight about the poem, is that sometimes it's a beloved, sometimes it's anybody, sometimes it's me reading the book, sometimes it's one of us. Walt Whitman remade American poetry, turning his back on traditional rhyme and meter, and you know, the rhyme and meter are still, of course, completely viable tools for poets. There's no reason that we can't make use of that. But America needed to push away from that tradition. It, it was hobbling uh, our poets. So if you look at great writers like Emerson and Thoreau, they're not especially good poets. And the reason for that is that their visions, their new sense of the expansiveness of the world and what you can learn from your observation of the world is hobbled and constrained by traditional form. Something about Americanness seemed to require an opening up, a relaxation of the terms, a more expansive form. So Whitman's long lines, his rolling cadences, these big expansive stanzas seem so right for an American poetry loaded with American terms, place names, slang words. In it, New York in particular finds itself recognized because it's full of New York details and slang. Um, and the, the pleasure of being a great city, the pleasure of expanding the sense of, of our authority is very much on stage for him. And he loves walking through the city. He likes Broadway and the stage coaches of the Battle of the Quickly. He likes the big display windows and the stores with the new invention of the flexible, not flexible glass, sorry, but plate glass, you know, that's uh, making a whole commercial landscape visible. He's so interested in what everybody's doing. And there's a way in which his consciousness floats over the city, through the countryside, taking in one thing after another and making these famous catalogs. Some readers object to them and, and find them dull. I think they're incredible because they're so specific and precise, full of detailed language, and also so totally various. Everything from the control, the pure control to singing in the choir loft in church to the Oh, poor, unfortunate, who's having an arm amputated uh, in a kind of mentioned hospital, and you hear the limb plop horribly. Whitman says, plop horribly in the pail. These lines, single lines that characterize lives, happen so quickly, and there's so many of them variation, that again, we get that sense of a vision of the whole of a country. Whitman became, with time, more of a nationalist, uh, less open than he was uh, politically and socially in his early work, but in those radical new, new poems, 1850s, 1860s, here's a poet who populates his poetry with more characters, more types of people than any other writer of his century, really. 
and who has a degree of empathy, a will to absorb all these voices, to look at everyone, to find affection and commonality between himself and all people. Enormously moving. And that's really, that almost his formal energy is why this poetry was so important for so many poets. Whitman was taken up wholeheartedly in Spain, beginning of the 20th century. I don't think we would have had Garcia Lorca and many other great Spanish poets were it not for Walt Whitman's influence. Similarly, in Latin America, Whitman lies right behind Pablo Neruda. That work is impossible without Whitman's influence and his kind of spirit moving through it. We see that kind of thing happening really all over the world. And I am so grateful to have been able to spend the last um, 20 years, basically, completely immersed in that work. Uh, in awe of it, trying to find my way in and consider the sources of Whitman's poetry and how it might speak to me directly, other readers directly, and how it might resonate in my own life, and I hope in American culture at this hour. We need to remember that this is here. We need to remember that somebody believed enough in what we could do, what we could create, something the world had not seen, a truly affectionate, loving, and generous democracy. It's still possible. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I mean, where do we even begin? I have to say, I'm I'm originally from the Philippines, and mm -hmm. in my tiny uh, American Catholic uh, school that I attended in elementary school, growing up in the tiny suburb of Las Piñas, I actually memorized Whitman. Whitman oh, was in my brick. I, I memorized "O Captain, My Captain," uh, when lilacs bloom, right. and actually, my teachers. I think it's crazy to think about it. it was second or third grade when we were reciting these um, way back in the day i'm dating myself when we were expected to recite poetry and memorize right. it um but my exper early experience with poetry was actually whitman and i was yes. terrible at it but just to show how far reaching whitman's poems are and um it also just i guess leads me to um my 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 next realization is because I was taught Whitman and I had to memorize him, I just took Whitman for granted after that. But in hindsight, all the poets that I realize I'll take with me to my desert island are all children of Whitman. So mm -hmm. I actually haven't forsaken Whitman. I just have learned all the, I've taken the different roads that Whitman's poetry has blazed. Uh, so on that note, I wanted to ask you, um, what compelled you to write this particular kind of book about Whitman, which is so specific to one work and so specific to your life? Let me talk a moment first about the two poems that you memorized. It's so interesting because okay. one is the external sure. Whitman, Captain My Captain. It's one of his worst poems. Right? It, it's a rhymed and metered Victorian ode to Lincoln uh, that has been memorized in high schools ever since or, or younger for the students too. It's a real evidence of Whitman wanting to be uh, the national poet, you know, wanting to be the good gray poet beloved. Where the other one, when I was last in the door, or bloomed as interior and moody, deeply death haunted, much more genuine kind of feeling. So it's, it's wonderful that you were exposed to both of those. I felt that Whitman was closed off to me as a younger reader. I loved many lines in the poems. I could see the beautiful images there, but I also saw him as a nationalist and a patriot. And coming of age in you know, the late 1960s, the early 70s, the last thing I wanted to read was a patriotic nationalist poet. So uh, I couldn't go there. When I was uh, first teaching college, I was a sabbatical replacement, it was an American literature course, and the first the, the uh, book list you know, was already prepared. So the first thing I had to teach was Song of Myself. And really reading that poem, closely, reading it as a poet, letting it roll over me was an overwhelming experience. And I'm trying to explain that to, to my students, you know, who are taking a, a literature course that met humanities requirement for their degrees and what their majors might be and weren't exactly up for a long poem, was an amazing experience to try to, to, try to do what Whitman did. He does he uses all his resources to bring us into the poem, and I was using all of mine to try to bring my students to him. And that was sort of a life-changing thing for me that has continued as I have more and more read and appreciated the remarkable risks he took, the ways in which the poems go places that is very difficult for language to go, into visionary experience, into kinds of knowledge that are not um, based upon uh, rationality, 
and logic necessarily. Um, yeah, and, and the, the brave eroticism of his poems, which is, you know, this is 1855, and there's such clear desire radiating off these pages. So, you know, all that, how could I stay away? I wrote some essays about Whitman early on, like around 2000 or so, and I read probably three of them, published them here and there, and a friend of mine said, oh, you're writing a book on Walt Whitman. And I thought, I am? And I knew he was right, immediately. It then took me almost 20 more years to, to get there, and that was because I had to figure out what did I have to say about this? It mattered to me intensely, but there is so much ink spilled over Whitman, and the last thing I wanted to do was to produce one more critical book. Uh, it seemed like so much had already been said, already been done, but something else caught my attention, which was the possibility of writing up a literary criticism which was very personal and inflected with memoir as well, um, and with cultural criticism and speculation. I wanted to think about changes in sexuality over time. I wanted to think about my own sense of sexual identity. Next to Whitman's, I wanted to think about the remarkable way in which this man seems a pioneer of 20th century life, of urbanity, of acceptance of others, and of, of sort of clear desire, making that clear and articulate to us, and value. He doesn't write with the intent of convincing anybody that his clear desire is okay. He just takes it as a given. Of course, it's fine, and he's going to tell us about it. It's remarkable. I also think surely on a language level that these poems never tire me out, especially you know, the earlier ones and the great poems. He wrote an awful lot, and there are only a handful of masterworks in it, but you know, three of four of the greatest poems in the English language is not bad. It's also remarkable how much of an outsider Whitman was not only perceived, but how he behaved. I mean, he... Mm -hmm was truly like the DIY. So in, in that respect, he anticipates uh, one of the great uh, countercultural publishing histories of our time, which is the Mimeo Revolution of the 60s. Mm -hmm. And you see uh, a lineage in Whitman in Ted Berrigan. You also see a lineage in Whitman, both in John Ashbery and uh, Frank O'Hara in the um, epic quotidian of Bernadette Mayer. And then in Neruda in South America, where you see a more political, overtly political kind of poetry mm -hmm. that branches or finds its way forwards into surrealism. Uh, and to kind of, I guess, bridge these poets and these time periods with Whitman's time period. And I think the compressed experience that he had is someone who really was operating on his own. And uh, uh, you mentioned his language. He was truly radical in his experimentation. And it was only in college that I appreciated the break that Whitman made possible in American poetry that I clearly see in my love of William Carlos Williams uh, and uh, a lot of the modernists. Um, I wanted to... Uh, ask you, when you were making the book, at what point did you embrace the idea that I am going to focus on Whitman and that this book would be, in fact, a memoir? Because you're both a poet and you're a critic and you're a memoirist. And as embracing Whitman, you can show that in multitudes. I knew early on that I did not want to write uh, a vanilla book of literary criticism. You know, a book that would have been a book for poets, and its audience would be people who already care about poetry and care about women. I wanted to make a book that had all the doors open so that any reader of uh, any degree of familiarity or unfamiliarity with the art could step into it. And I also want to talk about reading as a passion, the way that work that you love can inform your life and help to describe your life and see next steps. And for me, Whitman's work does that, that there's a a kind of brave standing, gazing into the future that he does almost habitually, that is very useful to me to hold on to as, as a model of the way to perceive. And I think also his great acceptance of others, um, his rising above the, the petty, you know. I was reading a wonderful passage earlier about, uh, you know, I shall not pass like a child's pearl cube. And he says in that, that he doesn't want to listen to people who say that life is but a suck and a sell. He's not going to have a kind of cynical approach to the world, but instead is just dedicated to um, a brighter point of view, 
a more humane and generous point of view. And that was enormously important to me. I couldn't do that. I couldn't talk about how much the poems had mattered to me without also being able to talk about myself as a sexual being, as a person in love or not, as a citizen of this country, as a user of language, all the ways, also as a, a citizen of a city and a lover of a great city, which is right now in terrible turmoil. You know, those positions inform my work as a critic and my active reading. So that's why those things needed to be in the book. His vision was cosmic, truly cosmic. And mm -hmm. in fact, this is a whole nother rabbit hole we may end up going down in terms of the mediumistic experience of writing Song of Myself, where it seemed like mm -hmm. it was summoned or he was barely a vessel, right? But this perhaps also corresponds with my next question. How do you think Whitman would be responding to today? Particularly this moment that we're in, um, the, the poetry of today, you know, the internet and all of that in many ways. He anticipates Instagram, right? Holding that pose, yeah. you write about it, holding that pose of the daguerreotype, that's three minutes of holding that pose and the intensity <laughs> right, right. of that is it's so uh, intense, intimidating and, and, and sensual all at once. And he did that mm -hmm. for three minutes, you know, owning that photograph and the photographer. Right. How would Whitman be Whitman today? I think Whitman would be game for, for just about whatever, you know, and, and what the moment brings would be something that he would want to investigate and probably embrace. Um, he called Lee's of Grass a language experiment. And, and I love that he was using that term of a good hundred years before anybody else was thinking about experimental language. He's experimental in his own very unique way. His poems are almost always in the present tense. They take account of the moment of their composition. They speak directly to the reader as if he says, I was chilled by the cold plate and ink between us. Now we get that out of the way and speak to you as a body. Whoever touches this, he said, meaning his book, touches a man. That verse has the ability to speak to people in a remarkable variety of ways, you know, as political inspiration, to activists, to move forward and make social change, as a spiritual inspiration. You mentioned the New York School, and one of the best New York School students' stories about Whitman is, oh, has to do with James Schuyler, who as a young man took his copy of the Leaves of Grass and spent the night in a tent out in the country someplace upstate New York. There was a big storm. There he was with the lightning crashing overhead, reading Leaves of Grass. He said it changed his life and confirmed for him that he was a poet. So if you think about Schuyler's work and its interest in the moment, in recording the minutiae of every day, in honoring the quotidian, of course. And then you think about the poets who come out of Skyrim, like Eileen Miles. Of course, it's Walt Whitman who has laid the foundation for those poems to exist. This moment, I think Whitman would be responding to everything that's going on in our national scene. I think of an extraordinary poem of his, uh, which is a condemnation of Congress and its inaction. He says, is that the president? Uh, it's a poem that just is full of loathing for inept officials who cannot manage what the country needs. Uh, he would clearly be writing editorials. He would be looking everywhere. He is not blameless, you know, or spotless in his politics. There is evidence of, of really racist stuff that Whitman said, I think, later on in his life. And I think it's part of um, his interest in evolution, which was a fascinating subject for him, as it was for many people of his time. And I think it also reflects um, weariness. You know, this is a man who had a deeply contradictory pair of urges. He wanted to be loved. He wanted to be a national poet, a sage, a bard. And he also was committed to being a sexual radical. You don't get to do those two things without real conflict and real crisis in your life. So he was always on the horns of this dilemma. How much do I advocate for change and what I believe? And how much do I package myself in order to make a living? Know, and be more acceptable. So that is reflected in some of his statements, I think. Nonetheless, nobody spoke against discrimination. Nobody spoke in favor of the common worth of human beings in his century, more than that man did, or spoke as well. Yeah, you know, that contradiction is something I wanted to touch on. And mm -hmm. I'm somebody who is not about canceling any writer, any artist, uh, mm -hmm. I will still, I will read The Wasteland, I will embrace um, uh, 
parts of the cantos and Palin's contribution, I certainly will, will read Amiri Baraka and mindful of these three poets, for example, they're, they're, they're human flaws, right? Um, but I wondered, as you were thinking about Whitman and you were embarking on a work of prose, if these considerations of the other side of Whitman were on your mind, because as C.A. Mm -hmm. Conrad argued in his really powerful uh, essay from Walt Whitman to Walmart, he argues that there were two discoveries of Whitman in his life, the poet who wrote Leaves of Grass that really helped mm -hmm. him come to terms with identity and sexuality. And then the prose writer where you actually see a, a writer who, who was embracing manifest destiny. The poet who wrote O Pioneer, right, which is an anthem for clearing the range and settler colonialism. And then you see that in even starker, more sobering terms in the prose where he is characterizing both the African-American uh, and uh, the First Nations person, Native American, in truly derogatory terms. Um, but as you mentioned, that that's later on in his life. But what was that negotiation like for you, specifically also because you were writing in prose, which is the medium where mm -hmm. this Whitman is so apparent? Well, I, ha I had to try to account for that you know, in, in some way. I do not in any way want to um, let him off the hook, you know, or excuse him because what he said was in those instances was inexcusable. It's something we can't really forgive or forget. But at the same time, um, we do have to, it helps to put it in some context that he, like all of us, is in some degree subject to and bound by the thinking of his times. He so transcended time and space in his best poems that it seems impossible that he could have been a citizen so attached to his own culture, but in fact, of course, he was. And so, you know, we get Walt Whitman, the visionary poet, who is his best self in his poems. And then there are times in the prose when he's sort of, for lack of a better term, infected by a groupthink or a kind of, uh, you know, intellectual fashion of his times. It was, um, Darwinism was so much in the air. You know, people were so interested in the evolution of species. And this idea that persons of a different race might be different evolutionary versions of the same species was uh, toxic, you know? And that was deeply problematic. Whitman was also, you know, coming of age as a writer at a time when psychology was first getting really interested in medicalizing the personality. Okay, so when he's writing in the late 1840s, early 1850s, there's really no such thing as abnormal personality, right? And then it starts creeping in from Europe, and psychiatrists, psychologists are very interested in identifying what's a normal personality, what's a healthy person, by looking at what they think isn't. So gradually, this, you don't see the word homosexual in print until 18, late 1870s, early 1880s, heterosexual doesn't show up until like 1890, you know, so these ideas that the world was split into two kinds of people, there was a binary between them, were very recent. And Whitman must have been scared of those ideas, and he died a couple years before the Oscar Wilde trial. But he, you know, knew about this change and this shift in perspective. When he was first writing Leaves of Grass, there was no such thing as a, a sort of sexual orientation or a sexual identity. It was simply behavior. You did what you did, and that didn't mean you were gay or straight or whatever, because there weren't such terms. As soon as that binary kind of splits the world in half, it starts to be us and them. It starts to be dominant group and subgroup. There's a, a, just a whole different way of thinking that is toxic. And I think he knew that and was being careful about it. He changed the pronouns in poems. He um, denied to a British researcher who point blank asked him you know, if he was attracted to men. Other people, of course, made it very clear that he was and had testimony of their sexual experiences with Whitman. But you understand, you, know, you sort of have to forgive him for wanting to make a living, you know, and wanting to um, be seen as a person who people could, whose work could be treasured and cared about. It's a terrible dilemma. It makes me think about the, the potential for both language arts for, or the role or the mm -hmm. responsibility, if you don't want to use that heavy word for the poem versus right. prose. What do you do in the poem versus what do you do in prose, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that, right. That, that disjunct, that disconnect between these two witnesses. But I wanted to uh, pick up on the notion at the time of Whitman, they didn't even have a term for queerness, for being mm -hmm. gay. And 
Uh, and yet you see not just in Leaves of Grass, but in Live Oak with Moss, right? I mean, these are poems that are really completely honest and transparent. Uh, I have to just share with you, I, I, in my previous incarnation as a public school educator at a high need school in Queens, in my AP class, after teaching sections of Song of Myself, I had students coming up in, a, in, a, in an environment that they, didn't, they otherwise didn't feel safe to. And this wasn't something planned, but it, it happened within the unit that I had taught Song of Myself, right? And I was very, you know, very careful to teach it in a way that was not direct in how they read it. But in their, you know, I would have a conversation where they were just coming coming out to me. And that's the power of uh, Song of Myself and certainly these grass. It makes me think. Another aspect of your memoir, the personal aspect of your memoir, where you share um, these really honest movies of navigating your identity, uh, your experience with uh, your ex-wife, and um, to even more specific experiences of being in these clubs and meeting men. And one particular experience I think nailed it for me when you started to talk about Song of Myself as a holy experience was your encounter with Whitman in bed. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, I'm one of the few living people who can say that that's actually what Whitman is true. As I worked on this book and read further and further into Whitman, I, I felt this increasing sense of, of presence and connection to who he was. I had early on visited his home in, uh, in Camden, New Jersey, and had a strange sense there of a kind, almost being able to, to see him, to smell his talcum powder, a strange feeling of connection. Later on, uh, I met a guy in Provincetown whom I was attracted to. We both lived in New York. I wound up going over to his place when we got back to the city. And in the middle of this sexual encounter, we sat back for a rest, to take a break for a minute, and I looked at his face, and suddenly atop this quite uh, defined, gray-haired, older man's body, there was Walt Whitman's face looking at me. It was the face, more or less, of the famous daguerreotype. Uh, he looks calm, beneficent, and like there's starlight in his eyes coming from, from some great distance. He's, he's looking back at the world in a way. And that picture was taken, I think, after a couple of years of visionary experiences that are chronicled in that first edition of Leaves of Grass, or at least alluded to. It was a remarkable experience. He was there for a minute, I took it in and he was gone. It felt like an absolute gift. I don't want to try to defend that experience and say it was his ghost or it was real. It doesn't matter to me at all. What matters is that I perceived that presence coming to see me, to look at me, to keep company with me as his poems promise. And it was a great spur towards this book and towards a sense of, of duty towards him, really. You know, I think when you, when you see an apparition, something is asked of you, it's, that's a kind of gift. And a request, it's a request, it's, it's a call for responsibility to this figure. And so one of the things I wanted to do is to restore Whitman, as it were, as a fully sexual being, as, as a presence in the world whose pioneering directness is, I think, of great value to queer people today. You know, And it's one that really did get suppressed for quite a while, or at least marginalized, and thus we have the Walt Whitman Bridge in Philadelphia, the Walt Whitman Service Area on the New Jersey Turnpike, uh, and uh, oh gosh, what else? The, um, the Walt Whitman Mall in Huntington, Long Island. You know things that, or we have grade school kids memorizing "Oh Captain, My Captain." You know we have a kind of um, correction of the record. And uh, you see Walt Whitman in all facets of all the different multitudinous poetry communities, right? It never oh, absolutely born. Absolutely. Uh, Whitman was so Just crucial to the Harlem Renaissance, you know? He, he really was in those poems. People like Langton Hughes found an American poet who was not writing from a racist position. So if you look at, particularly in, I sing the body electric um, in Song of Myself, the portrayal of black characters is extraordinary. In I sing the body electric, the speaker goes to an auction and the slave auctioneer is about to sell a black man the speaker says, ah, he's a lousy auctioneer. He doesn't know what he's doing. Let me do it. And proceeds to deliver a monologue that is 
bitterly ironic, since this man is worth more than any price you could possibly offer for him. And don't you understand that the same blood that's in your veins is in his? And don't you understand that from in some time in the future, he's going to be the person in power and you're not? You know, I mean, it's, it's a remarkable poem, wildly ahead of its time. And you know, I don't want things like that to be erased by um, some shabby journalism, you know, or, or off-the-cuff remarks. Of course he contradicts himself. He even told us he contradicts himself. But, you know, as we go through the canon of artists who have done remarkable work, we are always going to find errors, uh, uh, statements, points of view we don't agree with or like, or we're going to find some reprehensible behavior. I don't know what you do about that, except that you have to bring an attitude of, I would say, the acceptance of complexity, or at least the entertaining of complexity, that people are never perfect, except maybe in their work. We only have time for one more question, and one of the great things about your book, I, I could stop reading it, to be honest, once I started reading it, and I learned so much, not just about um, the creation of Lisa Grass, but certainly how to write about a poet whom you greatly admire, and one thing that I always ask myself heading into reading your book was, another book on Whitman, okay, and it's not just another book too. on Whitman, it's I was thinking along the lines of Susan Howe's My Emily Dickinson, this is Mark Doty's Whitman. Um, and it made me realize that the memoir perhaps is also an outgrowth of Whitman, a song of myself, certainly in your hands. And you seem to be uh, an engaging writer of the memoir, of prose, uh, your sentences, right? And I didn't know this heading into it, but I realized as I was reading Whitman how... Whitmanian memoirs could be, and in your book, it is. Whitman uh, wrote a book called Specimen Days, his, his prose collection, which is made of little short segments. Uh, you know, one put it after the other, chronologically, more or less. Um, it's the first disability memoir that I know about. It's a book that chronicles his time in the hospitals in D.C., working with Civil War wounded, and how difficult that was for his own health. It chronicles his stroke and his... Uh, differing abilities afterwards. So he did open that territory. And uh, the memoir offers, to my mind, this great relief for poets in that it feels more relaxed. There's a discursive movement you can spread out, you know, you can say a lot about something. No matter if you write a long poem, there's this requirement to compress every line, every word to carry its weight. And ultimately that's true in prose too, but it doesn't feel like it when you're composing it. There's room for context and commentary. There's room to, to spread out, you know, and digress as you might like to. And I love digression. I, I like weaving lots of stories, gathering the bits of something to make a larger picture. You can do that in poetry, but it's harder. Um, so I felt like, you know, I was also being ambidextrous. Like I have one hand in work that is more lyric, more compressed, maybe less explanatory more an event for the reader, an emotional event. And then I have this other hand in work that's longer, spreads out more, draws you into theory, narrative, considerations, stories by the past, um, reflection, all kinds of stuff. And it's wonderful to have these two different things to do. Nobody's ready, ready to write poetry all the time, I don't think. Yeah, I, I certainly admire um, the Whitmanian observer, specifically when you write from your personal places. Uh, experiences with your late partner through your encounters in the clubs and uh, towards the end of the book, which I really appreciate just from this aesthetic level. I just wanted to thank you so much, Mark Doty. What is the grass? Walt Whitman in my life is Mark's new book. Thank you so much. This was a pleasure. And that's our program for tonight. I want to wish everybody safety, good health, uh, security. Be safe if you're out demonstrating on the streets tonight. Poets House is with you. Until next time, I'm Paulo Avier. Take care. If you've enjoyed these programs, please consider giving a contribution to Poets House. For more than 30 years, they've kept the door wide open to everyone for the joy of poetry. Recently, they have temporarily had to shut the door and are reeling from the financial implications. Please give even a small donation if you can. Thank you.